this uh, unwillingly uh, by other people. He was working on mathematics and analysis. He discovered sets, etc. But he was not particularly interested in foundations of mathematics. Only later on that he uh, realized, and others realized, the potential of set theory in foundations of mathematics and connections with logic. So, uh, what logic do we use in set theory? Well, usually people use first order logic because we have some wonderful properties of first order logics, uh, which uh, we'll discuss a little bit. But of course, the most interesting one is its completeness and its compactness, which follows from its completeness. And um, there were also tries to do set theory in second order logic, and some philosophers like this very much because set theory in second order logic has uh, this quasi categoricity that is the only models are of the type V kappa, where kappa is a strong, uh, in, strongly inaccessible cardinal. This is an old theorem from, from, of Zermelo from the 1930s. Uh, so my talk is going to be about doing logic of different kind and combining it with some questions in set theory and some other questions. And I do apologize to those who have kindly invited me to give talks during the summer because this talk has already been around for them. Uh, so this is part of the work that I'm doing with uh, Joko Vananen at the University of Helsinki in Amsterdam. And it's part of a long standing project. Uh, so let me tell you more about it. So I'm very interested in singular cardinals. And so are many other people around here. And so somehow it is fascinating to know that singular cardinals have properties that are very different than regular cardinals. And as Menahem Koizman puts it, uh, well, singular cardinals were named so two years after they were invented, <laughs> in the sense that they were invented through a very unpleasant evening at a big uh, e event, uh, at a big conference, something like this one, perhaps even bigger, in which Julius Koenig claimed that he proved that the reals cannot be well ordered. And he presented the proof using uh, induction. Cantor was in the audience, uh, and he was very st struck by this statement because he was not warned in advance. And three days later, Hausdorff found a, uh, a mistake in this proof, which was to assume that all cardinals are regular, in a sense. So <laughs> you know, singular cardinals have been helpful to Cantor, so I couldn't resist uh, saying this anecdote. Uh, so here is a theorem about singular cardinals, which is in, uh, you know, uh, in the style of Cantor, although it was proved in the 1990s. It is the PCF theorem of uh, Sahron Shela, which implies what I've just stated here. And I always make the same type on my slides for all n, 2 to the aleph n, less than aleph omega implies that 2 to the aleph omega is less than aleph omega 4. So this celebrated theorem of Shellach is a, an example of compactness behavior. We have here compactness at the singular cardinal, which we do not have at regular cardinals. We know, all know that we can make the cardinal uh, power of the power set function while at regular cardinals, but this with no respect of what has happened before. But this shows that we cannot do that at singular cardinals. In fact, there are many compactness theorems about singular cardinals. I'll mention some of them below, and some of them were mentioned in other talks. Uh, also notice that Aleph 0, which is, of course, not a singular cardinal, but uh, it has some properties that are connected with cardinals that are singular and mostly the compactness. So one way to see that Aleph zero is special is to look at the compactness of first order logic. It's a very special theory. So uh, the question that we 
would like to consider is if there is a compact logic associated to singular cardinals. So let us see a little bit more what this could mean. So let me talk about some other research that goes back to the 1960s. It turns out that uh, some very interesting questions in model theory were considered in the 50s and 60s, and then they were not considered anymore uh, for very interesting reason that uh, it was discovered that the first order model theory has is, has properties that make it uh, close to ZFC. Almost everything in first order model theory is a ZFC theorem. And the reason for this is that many properties in, in first order model theory are expressible by ranks, and this was a big result of the 60s. People discovered the notion of stability, and then, of course, Shellas discovered classification theory. So this most set theoretic of model theorists, who is Shellach, at the same time acted as a, somebody who killed set theoretic model theory in the sense that the rest of the community in model theory, many people moved to the areas that depend on ZFC. And this move uh, resulted also in a move away of cert from certain topics that were central in the model theory of the 60s. Uh, and these topics were very theoretic. Recent movements in model theory have brought back an interest into this subject. Many of you will be aware of a uh, very dynamic research in L omega 1 omega. Well, Paul has a very nice paper on this. <laughs> uh, and this is very connected with outstanding open questions in model theory of today, such as the uh, complex, uh, the quasi-minimality of the complex numbers. So model theory and set theory are being connected again, and this, this research uh, is somehow kind of like going from the point where they stopped in the 60s and people haven't done much, and now we're looking back at it with our new eyes, with our new knowledge. A person who was uh, very active at that time was Carol Karp, whose name you might know because of her uh, name being associated to Karp's prize uh, in the, of the Association of Symbolic Logic. She was a student of Hankin, and she, start, she developed a particular logic called chain logic, which I'm going to, to tell you a little bit about. Uh, she uh, did her PhD thesis in 1959, and unfortunately, she died early, and uh, some of her theorems were only announced and not proved. And this wasn't developed as far as it should have been. Uh, so her motivation was to generalize recursion theory through the use of infinitary logics. Now, this is very interesting because uh, many people will have heard of uh, newest, uh, newer results on infinitary Turing machines, uh, results by Kopke, Hopkins and Lewis, and others. I will mention this at the end. But you see people in the 50s and the 60s already thought of these things, and somehow it didn't. So the most relevant part of this work concerns the work of one of her students, Ellen Cunningham who did her PhD thesis in 1974, which was two years after Karp's die, died. Uh, the beginning of all of this is a simple question. Let us consider a very simple-minded generalization of first-order logic. So the first-order logic, we think of finitely many, that is less than omega many conjunctions, and finitely many quantifiers to less than omega, and we call that L omega omega. Now let us consider logic of the form L kappa lambda, where we are allowed of like less than kappa and iterations of less than lambda many quantifiers. What can we say about such logic? So the first order logic is L omega omega. So the question is to find pairs kappa lambda where uh, we have nice properties of lambda kappa, L kappa lambda, 
that we are used for having for L omega omega. Now, there are some theorems that actually characterize first order logic uh, as the only one that has a certain set of three nice properties. So you cannot push this as far as you might hope. But still, you can ask for completeness, compactness, etc. And as I mentioned, this was an important research topic at that time. And so basically what it was found, what was found is that if we want to recover the properties for kappa and lambda regular, most often we need to work with some large cardinal notion. And some large cardinal notions that we use on everyday basis in set theory actually were introduced for these reasons, such as strongly mm -hmm. compact cardinals. One exception to this is L omega 1 omega, which satisfy completeness, as we shall recall. So let me now uh, comment on this connection. So let us think of how we prove compactness of first order logic. This is basically a trivial consequence of the co uh, completeness of first order logic. Uh, so suppose that you have a set of sentences that is not satisfiable, so by completeness it must prove a contradiction. A proof is a finite object, so it will only involve a finite subset of, of these statements, call it sigma zero. So sigma zero is not satisfiable, and therefore sigma is not finitely satisfiable. So through this proof of by contradiction, we get compactness immediately from completeness. But let us notice that there is something hidden behind this. The, what is hidden is that the notion of deduction is closely matched to the notion of satisfaction in this logic. So when we consider generalized logics, we still keep the same notion of a proof. The proof is still a finite object. So you cannot get such a nice uh, con uh, conclusion. So there are logics that are complete, but are not compact. So an example is this logic L omega 1 omega. Uh, so let me just show you why this isn't compact. Take omega plus 1 many constant symbols, and let us take the sentences that say that for all x, x is equal to some cn, but c omega is not equal to any cn. And so this here is a finitely satisfiable set of sentences, but it is not satisfiable. So you don't get compactness from complete. So the theorem of Karp in 1964 says that L omega 1 omega is complete. And again, this is because we have rules of inference that are still connected to the first order logic. We haven't changed the rules of inference. So we cannot have the same easy way of getting compactness. Uh, so if you were to consider rules of inference, here is uh, Sorry, we have the same notion of proofs, but we have different rules of inference because we obviously have to say something about those countable conjunctions. So you need a new rule which says that if a countable conjunction is true, then every statement is true. So it turns out, sort of unexpectedly, that in generalized logic, compactness is harder than completeness. And this is not the only example. So now let me mention this connection with large cardinals, uh, say that the set of sentences is kappa satisfiable if every subset of size less than kappa has a model. So Tarski defines strongly compact cardinals in terms of satisfiability of sentences. So uh, he defined it to be such an uncountable kappa which satisfies that every kappa satisfiable set of L kappa kappa sentences is satisfiable. So we use strongly compact cardinals in uh, different ways with embeddings. There are topological equivalences of this. Uh, you know, work of Istvan, interesting you know, variants of this that appear. But this was actually the, the original. And he also defined weakly compact cardinals 
So this is the same definition, but now you require that the sentences in question involve at most kappa non-logical symbols. And that way you get weakly compact cardinals. So this shows that if you want to have compactness of logics of the type L kappa kappa immediately, you are thrown into the world of large cardinals. And this seems to be somewhat unsatisfactory. Uh, now, Judy Green was another student of uh, type L kappa omega. And she was asking, what kind of kappa can have can give us a logic L kappa omega such that we can get something out of it that resembles L omega 1 omega. And she was in particular interested in completeness. And this is when the idea of singular cardinals started coming in because she used different but similar techniques in two cases. Kappa successor over regular or kappa singular or successor singularity started to show up in her work. And what she did is to define proof systems for these logics. And the proofs in the system had length less than kappa. And this definition was done so that the following theorem holds. Uh, uh, the way that I state this theorem is that Karp stated this theorem as some sort of a conjecture. She had a lot of visions that she did. She was very ill at the end of her life. She had a terminal illness. She stated all of this and was hoping that somebody would prove them. And so Green did. And there are many nice properties of the first order logic when you consider this type of proofs. Now, there is a new idea that comes in it, and this idea will be interested fa interesting for us, is how to move from countable to cofinality omega. This is how we get into the, large, uh, into the singular cardinals. Uh, so you see from the way that I have set up the talk so far that, in fact, what we think at the beginning that you know, logic has semantics and syntax, there is more to it. There is more to what we do in mathematics than just semantics and syntax. There is also the proof systems. And there is the notion of satisfaction. So uh, it turns out that one can change the notion of satisfaction in model theory from Tarski's definition to actually get one that is more suited for this type of research, and that's what CARP did. So she changed the logic and the structure of an underlying model to approach the logic L kappa kappa, where kappa is a singular cardinal of countable cofinality. Uh, so if you are interested to see more of her work, there is this lecture that she uh, gave with many of her uh, conjectures and have feelings of how things should go, from countable to cofinality omega. <coughs> and what she did is to define this notion of a chain model. So these are models that have size kappa. Kappa is some singular cardinal. It could be a regular cardinal, but it's mostly interesting when it's a singular cardinal. And what she considers are models that have size kappa, but that are actually decomposed into a, into a union of subsets into a chain, that's why they call chain, whose length is cofinality kappa. So uh, we shall concentrate on the case of countable cofinality, or on the case that the chain consists of sets of strictly increasing cardinalities. Uh, so a typical situation would be this chain model with decompositions like that. And even more interesting is the case when kappa is a strong limit and two to the size of 
size of a n plus one. So of course, if we define this idea of a model, then we have to change the idea of satisfaction because the usual idea of satisfaction <coughs> is connected to the model just being any non-empty set. So what we do here, we define a new notion, chain satisfaction, which uh, is given for formulas phi of x bar of the logic L kappa kappa. So the x bar is anything that has less than kappa many uh, variables. So this chain model, chain satisfies an existential statement if there is an n such that a n satisfies the existential statement in the classical sense. So this is a, uh, a, a recursive definition on the complexity of formulas and uh, the interesting the only different case from the classical notion is the existential quantifier. So in fact, anything that happens in this model has to be bound, uh, witnessed by a bounded part. And then you can naturally define logic, and this logic is the chain logic kappa kappa. Uh, so Karp and Cunningham prove that this chain logic satisfies completeness and also some other nice properties. For example, downward Lowenheim's column theorem. And the spirit of their work is that the chain logic behaves very much like L omega 1 omega. Um, so this is basically where Yoko and I started looking at this logic. We were interested in something that didn't have anything to do a uh, priori with logic. One of my other uh, areas of interest is the area of universality. So we were looking at trees and tree embeddings, and we were wondering about the size of universal families of trees uh, at kappa plus, at kappa, where kappa is a singular cardinal. So we were looking at trees, t and t prime, and the embedding is defined as a strictly order-preserving embedding. It doesn't have to be an injection. And it turns out that there are many interesting questions about this kind of relation. For example, under CH, uh, there, uh, the universality number is for trees of size omega 1 is uh, 2 is the continuum. Uh, well, no, sorry. Uh, under GCH, the, the number is 2 to omega 1, so the maximal possible, which makes it different than what you know about universality number in first order theories are equal to 1 at uncountable cardinals when GCH holds. And there is an open question, which it's hard to believe that this question is still open, but it is, and your first idea is not going to work. <laughs> Find the universality number of the class of trees of height omega 1 without uncountable chains under MA. There, is a, there was a false claim in the literature about this. And because of this, a new, uh, this false claim was in the 1980s, and because of this, a uh, new kind of trees were developed by Todorcevic. The claim wasn't his. These are Lipschitz trees. So this is a very interesting question, still open. Anyway, we were interested in the case of Kappa singular cardinal, and we were pleased to C, that actually the number can be calculated in Z of C, and it's kappa plus. So we can actually construct the universal family of size kappa plus. I understand that uh, Luca very kindly gave me some introduction to the talk when he was talking about uh, what Yoko and I did in that paper from the point of view of the script of set theory. Uh, so Yes, so let me then maybe mention a little bit more about that paper. So it's a paper from 2011. So we analyzed uh, the family of chain models 
and coded as the elements of the topological space kappa to omega, where kappa is a strong limit, cof of kappa is omega. So this is how we came to descriptive set theory. Uh, as you know, countable models uh, lead themselves to, uh, to representation of the elements of the bare space. And this is something similar. We also did other cofinalities. And you know, then you can look at the orbit of a chain model, which codes the set of all G, which codes chain isomorphisms to the model you started from. And our main theorem actually is something that connects many different things. So the orbit of a chain model is always a sigma 1, 1 set. It's a delta 1, 1 set if and only if there is a tree of height and size kappa with no unbounded branches, such that for any chain model B, player 1 has a winning strategy in a certain error fright rosé game. <coughs> and if and only if a, uh, this it has a winning strategy if and only if A is chain isomorphic to B. So those of you who have looked at Scott analysis of countable models will recognize that this is exactly the same theorem. Of course, the proof is totally different, but this means that this logic is interesting and it has a uh, potential to, to give us some nice things that we know about first order logic. And so I guess this theorem somehow completed the classical analysis of chain logic. And now our project, present project is twofold. First, we feel that this theorem is, we are happy about it, but we would like to have some applications. I come from that school of mathematics, which actually feels that applications and theory are connected. And, uh, to me, applications are applications to objects in mathematics, to objects in model theory, in topology, etc. So if I have a theorem, I feel that it should also have some, some applications. So do we have applications of this theorem? Uh, it seems that completeness of the first order logic has many applications, yet our theorem seems to be purely abstract and doesn't have any applications. So, well, it has some applications. Maybe I'm being tough on us, but we should have more applications. So what kind of applications could we look for? So our project is to try co to get combinatorial theorems about singular cardinals such as beta omega as a consequence of this knowledge that we have of this logic, as a consequence of known properties of strong logics. Uh, so let me just mention some that we could try. So let us fix a singular strong limit cardinal of cofinality omega. Less would suffice, but uh, this is the most interesting case. So let, let me mention some nice known theorems that we could perhaps try to obtain as a test of knowing something about the logic. Here is a theorem from 1949, Dorzhentarsky. It's about Boolean algebras. I think most people know this uh, from the context of forcing because it says something about the chain condition of forcing. So it says if a Boolean algebra has an antechain of any size less than kappa, then it has an antechain of size kappa. So then there is this wonderful theorem by Schellach, Schellach's singular cardinal compactness theorem. It's really nice. It has many consequences, yet it's not an easy theorem to state because it talks about the freeness of certain axioms, etc. It takes a while to state. It has fantastic consequences. Here is one of them. Uh, in graph theory, if you have a graph such that every subset of size less than kappa has a small coloring number less or equal than lambda, uh, then also G has small coloring number. The coloring number, if you don't know what it is, it's uh, the possibility to order your graph, well order your graph in a way that under this well order, every, uh, well, every, uh, the chromatic number of the graph with the well order becomes, uh, is the coloring. 
So I mentioned this also to tell you that the analog of this theorem with the chromatic number is not known. And there are many attempts to prove this. Uh, Shella himself has produced some <coughs> attempts which unfortunately so far at least did not converge. Uh, so this is actually an open question. Here are some other open questions. Here is one for Istvan. Istvan and I have a paper which we wrote together on biorthogonal systems of size Aleph, Womek, uh, Aleph 1. How about diorthogonal systems that are of singular length? So uh, let me say what a biorthogonal system is. You all know what an orthonormal basis is in a, uh, well, in a, in the Hilbert space. So these are vectors that have norm one and that are mutually uh, orthogonal. Uh, so in general Glana spaces, there is no such, there is no guarantee that such a thing exists. And the Glana space in general doesn't even have to have a basis. But a poor man's version of a basis is a biorthogonal system. It's a system of points and functionals which behave like the orthonormal basis. And it's an old theorem of Rolovich that every infinite dimensional Bana space has such a thing of countable length. In our paper, we considered length omega 1. Todorovich has beautiful results about length omega 1 and omega 2 on the Martin maximum for omega 1 and Justin ZFC uh, for omega 2 and Justin ZFC for omega 1. Okay, so there are results. There is a whole book about these biorthogonal systems. But I don't think that they have been cons considered in singular length. So that's something that might be interesting. Uh, okay, so here is a question of which I talked with Boban. Uh, we had, had some ideas. So basically, if you have a complete L omega 1 omega sentence and it has a model of size aleph n for every n, does it then have a model of size aleph omega? It's a very interesting question. Uh, and then this is the one about the uh, which I already mentioned. So, well, let's see what we could do. So the first thing to do in this kind of strong logics is to work on the completeness. But the pro completeness is usually proved not using the proof that Gödel's had in his work, but using something that Hankin discovered when he reproved Gödel's theorem in a different way. So Hankin has a proof of Gödel's completeness theorem, which is the proof that you would usually find in the literature when you look for the proof of Gödel's theorem, at least in model theoretic literature. And he has this system called consistency properties. And it turns out that in strong logics, you can also talk about consistency properties. Uh, so, for example, Karp's proof about L omega, one, L omega 1 omega is based on these consistency properties. So these consistency properties prove what's called model existence theorem. And I will tell you in a minute what these two things mean, consistency properties and model existence theorem. Model existence theorem, you may guess, tells you that the model exists. So it's something like completeness. Uh, so Kiesler has a very nice book on L omega 1 omega. Kiesler, by the way, is my hero. This guy, 50 years in advance of everybody. What he did 50 years ago, people are working on today. And this goes for many different subjects. So uh, I think. In addition to all the lovely theorems that he proved, he also has a very unique vision. And so he was a, a, a great fan of L omega 1 omega and wrote a book. Uh, and he states in this book that if you want to do L omega 1 omega, you could actually replace compactness of L omega omega by these model existence theorems in many arguments. And he gives many proofs. And how about these consistency properties? They were invented by Mackay in 1969, 
also a very impressive mathematician, working in many different <laughs> subjects and coming up all the time, including the homotopy type theory. Uh, so using ideas from earlier work by Schmillian. So what is the consistency properties? It's a judiciously chosen set of sentences of a certain logic. And the precise definition depends on the logic, but the point is to be able to prove the following type of theorem, such as this theorem of Markheim from 1969. A sentence of L omega 1 omega has a model if and only if it belongs to a consistency property. So we call such theorems model existence theorems. Uh, so for example, Kiesler books give an application of this method to the following theorem, which is called undefinability of well order, and which was proved by two different proofs and independently by Morley in 65 and Lopez Escobar in 66. So it says that if you have a countable set of sentences of L omega 1 omega, and you have u and less than uh, unary and binary relation symbols of, uh, well, of L omega omega, then suppose that for all alpha less than omega 1, T has a model in which this less symbol linearly orders the predicate U so that U is actually contains the ordinal alpha. So for every ordinal you can find a, an interpretation there, a model which interprets this order as some order which is at least of order type alpha then you can have a model where actually this order contains a copy of Q. So you cannot define a well ordering. You cannot say that this Q, that this less is a well ordering because it will have a copy of Q. So consistency properties were found by Green for logics of the form L lambda omega and by Cunningham for the chain logic LC kappa kappa in the early 70s and both were working under the influence of CARP. Unfortunately, neither Cunningham nor CARP continued their career as mathematicians, as far as I know. Uh, so how do they look like? Let me show you how do they look like. Typically, you have your logic you're interested in, you have the formulas that you're interested in, and then what you would want to do is to define a set of sets of formulas such that they somehow represent everything that there is in this logic. So for every atomic sentence, you either put that one or the negation. If you have a disjunction, you put one of them in the set. Or if you have a huge disjunction, the same thing. Uh, if you have a universal quantifier, then you put the witnesses into this, uh, oh well, you can think of uh, existential quantifier at the same time, also you put witnesses for negation, okay, so it looks a bit messy, and it's a non-trivial matter to develop this kind of property, and for logic to have it. So in our work in progress, we are interested in higher versions of chain logic, what I mean are second order or restricted second ordered versions of the logic of chains. And why are we interested in that? Well, because some of the applications in mind are sometimes expressed in this way. So uh, if you think of the, some of the applications that I have had there, for example, to express a biorthogonal system, you would need some, some small amount at least of second order. Uh, so what we want to do here is we bound set and if we do that we get this logic L2C kappa kappa and well you know Yoko spent the last at least one year of his uh, last year as being the vice rector of the University of Helsinki so we didn't get to really go through the details of this proof. But so we will go through the details of this proof, and this is still subject to verification, but uh, at least I think it's fine. Um, 
So L2C kappa kappa has a consistency property. So this means that we have this set of sentences which says that a sentence of L2C kappa kappa has a model if and only if it belongs to a consistency property. So you can actually say which sentences of this logic have models. And I have to say why this would be interesting. This is because it's known that the full logic L kappa kappa doesn't have such a property. But the chain logic of the first order chain logic does. So that's why this is interesting. And certainly the full second order L kappa kappa doesn't have such a property. So the, the whole mantra that we're trying to discuss here is that it is easier for a chain for a sentence to have a chain model than it is to have a full model. So, for example, consider this sentence, less is a well order. So you can construct a chain model of this sentence, which is not a real model. So you take increasing blocks, think of them here, and each one of those blocks uh, has cardinality beta n. So a n has cardinality beta n. And we put all of them below each other. So everything in here is less than in here and so forth. So this uh, obviously is not a well order in the, in the sense of the full model because we have forced an increasing sequence. But since our definition of satisfaction is that everything has to be uh, witnessed by a bounded piece in chain logic, this actually is chain, is a well word. Uh, this example is interesting because often this is how you prove the lack of compactness, because the well order is obviously something that's not compact. So if your logic can define well order, well, your compactness is gone. So but this here looks, makes you think that maybe we can prove compactness. Hmm? Unfortunately not, because we can prove that second order logic is not countably compact, even in chain models. And how do you prove that? Well, you introduce another predicate. So suppose that you have a second order sentence theta, which says that you have some well order on a predicate P. And so in chain models of uh, theta, we don't have any guarantee that this is really a well ordered, as we have just seen. But now we're going to change this a little bit. We're going to tweak it to overcome that point. So we can take the second order sentence in which we actually say there exists an y, p of y implies that x of y. And this looks like a silly sentence. But the point is that the chain models of this are the chain models in which P is contained in one level of the chain, because X has to come from one level. And in these models, we have full second order quantification over subsets of P. And now when we look at the conjunction theta and phi, we know that this is actually really a well ordered. So we cannot hope for compactness in second order chain logic. Because we can form a finitely consistent theory consisting of these two sentences. And then we say p of c n for n less than omega and the, the, the chain c0 larger than c has no chain models. But it has models of finite, it's finitely satisfied. OK, so let me move on, because I promised this, and many people ask about this. It's an interesting thing. And I just talked to Julia, who is doing a thesis on finite automata. Uh, well, when you have a logic, it's 
tempting to associate an automaton to that logic. This has been done for first order logic, which uh, did quite a lot of success, and that's what she's studying. But it's also very tempting to associate the, to a logic a uh, Turing machine. So many of you have heard of this nice paper of Hamkins and Lewis, which does Turing machines with ordinal time computation. Uh, actually, uh, who introduced a similar definition and who has done a lot of work on this. So many people work now on these generalized Turing machines. It's a little bit like the generalized Borel spaces. It's a, it's a nice and rich area of research. And uh, how real is this kind of Turing machine in which you can compute forever or for an ordinal length of time? Uh, this is, of course, a philosophical question because you cannot really compute the ordinary Turing machine either because there you need an infinite uh, uh, infinite information to start with because where you write your input is an infinite thing. The real Turing machines don't exist. I think the biggest one that has been built has an input size of four. So, <laughs> you know, just because something doesn't exist physically doesn't mean we shouldn't be studying it. So in this area, what you can do is uh, to uh, prove connections between this kind of uh, computability and something that you would uh, think is means to be definable for us who do set theory. So what it means for us to be definable is to be in L. And it should be recognized by such machines. And this lovely paper that I'm quoting here, Karl, Schlicht, and Welsh, actually proves such things. Uh, and also, I should say that Kopke also had similar results, and I have to understand exactly where the two definitions are different, etc. So, this is an interesting talk. One thing that you might think now well, okay, let me look at the Turing machine, which has computations of length kappa singular cardinal, but I require the computation to end at some end. So that should be connected with the chain logic. And it should also kill the doubts of the purists, because this is just something finite, right? You just stop at some finite end. Uh, well, a person who is a logician working in an engineering department and running a big show, called Dusko Pavlovich, and uh, we started talking about uh, this, and he told me, you know, there is this cryptographer called Patarin, Pataran, who's, who considered this at some point, uh, and he wanted to discover a cryptographical value of such models. Uh, he ran a bit of a, into a trouble because I think he underestimated the set theory that one needs in this. But it's quite interesting. So we are looking with Pavlovich in, in these computation machines, you know, on the odd days, we think that it's great, and on the even days, he tells me, you know, this is all just theology. Anything that's infinite is theologically uh, related only and not real. But it's fun, and uh, we are thinking of various, actually, not only of this computational model, we're also thinking of some computational model which has Borel sets in the in the in the heart, so that you have two players, safe and unsafe, and each are trying to put some information, and they are trying to block each other, and you use some Borel, uh, you know, uh, descriptive set theory to prove existence of certain strategies for the good guy. So we shall see where that goes. But anyway, I think it's fun that such connections exist. And here I stop. Thank you very much for your attention.